Thank you very much indeed. Um, Mr. Secretary, you said just a moment ago you anticipate negotiators will be getting together in the coming days. Could you just give us a bit more detail, uh, perhaps about when and who and how significant that is? And moving on to what's happening on the ground in Gaza, the war crimes lawyer Philippe Sands told the BBC yesterday that it is impossible to see what is going on now in Gaza and not say crimes are screaming out. We know that Linda Thomas-Greenfield told the Security Council the US is watching to ensure a, quote, policy of starvation is not being carried out by Israel. Uh, the newspaper Haaretz this month quoted three reserve soldiers in Gaza saying it was their impression that the so-called general's plan was being carried out. One said commanders openly refer to it. Uh, people sat and wrote a systematic order with charts and an operational concept, they said, at the end of which you, you were to shoot whoever isn't willing to leave. Now, we know the Israeli leadership denies that this is happening because you asked them on Tuesday. But the former deputy head of Israel's National Security Council, Eran Etzion, has described northern Gaza as a very dangerous erosion of norms, saying that war crimes may be taking place, and if a soldier is expected to commit these, they must refuse. So the, my question is, do you agree with that? If an Israeli soldier is ordered to carry out any part of this apparent plan today, should they refuse? And Mr. Prime Minister, um, do you agree with the Americans' assessment that Yahya Sinwar was the chief ob obstacle to a ceasefire deal. And following that, I mean, who are you talking to in Hamas at the moment? Are you getting any engagement? Are they prepared to come back um, to the table? Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, first, on, uh, on negotiations, on negotiators, on the one where the, the who, can I provide more information? The answer is no. Um, but uh, that will unfold. Uh, in the coming days, all I can tell you is what I said earlier and what the, the, the Prime Minister noted is that we do anticipate that the negotiators will be getting together in the coming days. And uh, again, what we really have to determine is whether Hamas is prepared to engage. Um, and I believe that we'll uh, be able to do that starting in the coming days. Uh, with regard to the, uh, the so-called General's Plan uh, in the North, let me just say again, First, again, what we really have to do that was how, in a press conference in Qatar, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken um, and, uh, was left fumbling when a BBC uh, presenter that, posed a question that days. appeared to catch him off guard. Uh, the viral moment, the, uh, which has since so spread widely across social media, exposed the flawed again. logic First, of Blinken's defense of U.S. policies regarding the ongoing crisis in Gaza. Jackson. The secretary, whose frequent visits to Israel have coincided with the increased flow of arms to the Israeli military, seemed to struggle with offering any meaningful justification for the destruction and widespread civilian casualties in Gaza, all while attempting to paint the humanitarian catastrophe as a necessary evil to end the rule of the Palestinian resistance group. The spectacle was a stunning reminder of the United States' notorious double standards when it comes to human rights. While the U.S. positions itself as a global defender of human dignity and civil liberties, particularly when it concerns countries like China, Russia, or North Korea, its unflinching support for Israel's actions in Gaza flies in the face of its proclaimed values. For decades, the U.S. has used its platform to lecture the world on human rights, regularly admonishing China over the treatment of the Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang. The U.S. has threatened Beijing with sanctions over these alleged abuses, holding China's feet to the fire in the name of human rights. Similarly, in the case of Russia, the U.S. has imposed countless sanctions, transforming Russia into one of the most heavily sanctioned nations globally, all under the idea of defending Ukraine's sovereignty after Russia's brutal invasion and annexation of Crimea and Donbass. The U.S. decried Moscow's actions, labeling them as violations of the rules-based international order a phrase that has become synonymous with Washington's selective enforcement of international norms. Yet when it comes to Israel, Blinken and his counterparts seem to conveniently forget these principles, defending Israel's actions while ignoring the humanitarian disaster unfolding in Gaza. 
Content like this often gets overlooked by the algorithm, making it harder for important truths to reach the people who need to hear them. You have the power to change that. By liking, sharing with your loved ones, and spreading the word, you help ensure these critical perspectives don't go unheard. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and stay connected for the latest updates and deep analyses on Iran, Lebanon, Gaza, and beyond. Together, we can make sure the real story gets told. Uh, in the coming days, all I can tell you is what I said earlier and what the, the, the Prime Minister noted is that we do anticipate that the negotiators will be getting together in the coming days. And uh, again, what we really have to determine is whether Hamas is prepared to engage. Um, and I believe that we'll uh, be able to do that starting in the coming days. Uh, with regard to the, uh, the so-called General's Plan uh, in the North, let me just say again, First, the United States fully and fundamentally rejects it. Uh, second, as I told you the other day, uh, the government of Israel uh, says that it is not the policy uh, of Israel and also rejects the plan. Uh, we reject any effort um, to create a siege, to, uh, to, to starve people, to um, hive off northern Gaza from the rest of Gaza. Uh, we've been very clear about that. Uh, we'll remain very clear about that. But again, from the, uh, uh, the words of the, the Prime Minister directly to me, that is not Israel's policy. Uh, second, we're intensely focused on the situation for people in Gaza, uh, and particularly making sure that they get the assistance they need, uh, but also making sure that the norms of uh, international humanitarian law uh, are upheld. And indeed, the letter that Secretary Austin and I wrote recently uh, to our counterparts is based on that fundamental premise. Uh, and Everything that we're doing uh, and everything that we're focused on uh, involves making sure, to the best of our ability, that those norms are upheld and that we're maximizing uh, the uh, ability both to protect people and to make sure that they're getting the help that they need. And as I said a few moments ago, uh, this is a, a matter of great urgency and intense focus for us uh, right now and in the days ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, just, uh, you know, answering to your question, uh, whether we see Sinwar as an obstacle, I'm just, you know, I need to be very clear and very mindful that our role as a mediator, we fully respect it. And our policy, we don't speak about any party who would represent the obstacle and start, you know, to point on one over the other yet. Uh, we have throughout the process that we've been through in mediation in different fronts. Uh, we have never seen something like this being in the media more on, in the negotiation room. So you can go throughout the process and you can see on each stage where it's stopped and it will be very clear who is stopping at each stage of that. So I just wanted to make sure that there is nothing uh, from Qatar will say on one party or another. So Ala Thalef, Andrew Mills, Reuters. We have the third question from Reuters. Uh, thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to ask questions today. Um, this uh, impending round of negotiations, will this include Gaza and Lebanon, or will this round of negotiations in Doha only be focused on uh, reaching a ceasefire in Gaza. Could you also please talk about what kind of deal will be on the table? Is this President Biden's proposal from May, or will this be something new? And if it's new, what will it be? Um, and will we see these negotiations take place before uh, the U.S. election? Um, and then uh, perhaps for both of you, um, you know, Israel yesterday accused 
six colleagues from Al Jazeera of being members of Hamas or Islamic Jihad. Uh, and Jazeera has condemned this, calling those allegations unfounded and suggesting that the, that may be justification for Israel's targeting of journalists. What, what is, uh, I'd like to hear from both of you about your response to this, this latest development regarding Al Jazeera and its journalists in Gaza. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to start. So, uh, in referring to negotiators coming back uh, together, that was referring specifically to negotiations on the return of hostages and a ceasefire for Gaza. Uh, and that is the uh, entire focus of, of their work. Separate from that, is work that we're doing also very intensely uh, on Lebanon uh, to reach a diplomatic resolution, to see the full implementation of uh, 1701, uh, to enable people to return to their homes. Um, that's separate, but it's equally intense and involves a lot of work in trying to get clear understandings of how we would implement 1701, uh, and I think we're making progress on that. Um, Going back to the negotiations on uh, ceasefire and, and hostage deal, I think one of the things we're doing is looking at uh, whether there are different options uh, that we can pursue to get us to, uh, to a conclusion, uh, to get us to a, to a result. Uh, and so we're talking uh, both with uh, our mediating partners in Qatar uh, and in Egypt uh, about that, and this is something that the uh, negotiators will be discussing as well when they get together. Uh, with regard to the uh, report on, on Al Jazeera, um, I can't speak to the veracity of that, uh, of that report. Uh, it, uh, it clearly needs to be examined. Um, we very much support the work of journalists in Gaza and everywhere else uh, around the world, inc including in areas of conflict. Uh, and we're equally determined that journalists be protected. Far too many have lost their lives in Gaza. Uh, we're uh, determined to do what we can to ensure that, again, they can do their work as safely and securely as possible, recognizing that in any conflict zone, of course, there's inherent danger. During the press conference, it became increasingly painful to watch as Blinken sidestepped questions about the 70-plus years of Palestinian suffering. Not once did he acknowledge the root causes of the Palestinian resistance or the fact that Gaza, often referred to as the largest open-air prison in the world, has been under a brutal blockade for decades. Instead, Blinken's focus remained firmly on absolving Israel of any wrongdoing portraying the state as a victim in a conflict it helped perpetuate through occupation and settlement expansion. One of the most glaring omissions in Blinken's remarks was the ongoing illegal settlement construction in the West Bank, a clear violation of international law that the U.S. itself has in the past called out. Yet here, in front of the global media, Blinken made no mention of the settlements, nor did he speak of the daily humiliations faced by Palestinians living under occupation. Instead, his remarks seemed aimed at presenting Israel as a normal, peace-seeking country whose existence was the result of the consent of the land's indigenous people, an assertion that ignores the violent displacement of Palestinians during the creation of the Israeli state. Blinken's attempt to cast the Palestinians as aggressors and Israel as the perpetual victim felt disconnected from reality, a manipulation of facts that quickly unraveled during the press conference. His narrative, which sought to justify Israel's military actions under the guise of self-defense, appeared increasingly hollow in light of the death toll in Gaza, which now exceeds 40,000 people, many of them civilians. Rather than promoting a ceasefire or meaningful diplomacy, Blinken's visits to Israel have seemingly focused on ensuring the continued flow of U.S. weapons to the Israeli military, weapons that have been used to pummel Gaza's civilian infrastructure. Further complicating the narrative, Blinken blamed the late Palestinian resistance leader Yahya Sinwar for stalling hostage negotiations, a claim that has been widely contested by those familiar with the talks. While Sinwar has indeed insisted on previously agreed-upon terms with the Israeli government, 
It is Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu who has continuously obstructed any real progress. Netanyahu's refusal to expedite the return of hostages is seen by many as a political maneuver designed to prolong the fighting in Gaza. His calculus appears to be that a swift end to the hostage crisis would weaken the justification for the ongoing military offensive, undermining his broader objectives in Gaza. Reinforces once again for me and for all of us the urgency, the imperative of bringing them home, bringing all of them home. We talked about the plan that we've had on the table and the work that we're doing on that plan, looking at new frameworks and formulations as a possibility. Uh, we talked about the importance of determining whether Hamas is prepared to engage in moving forward. And the Egyptians, the Qataris, are doing just that. But I believe that with Sinwar gone, because he was the primary obstacle to realizing a hostage agreement, there is a real opportunity to bring them home and to accomplish the objective. With regard to what follows in Gaza, this is critical because we have to end the war in a way that keeps Hamas out, make sure that Israel doesn't stay and Israel does not want to stay. But we have to have clear, concrete plans for what follows. So we're spending a lot of time focused on that question, talking not only to uh, Israelis, but talking to many Arab partners. We've had these conversations for some time. I'll be pursuing them in the days ahead uh, as we meet with Arab partners, both here uh, and in Europe. And we're working to get clear understandings for Gaza's governance, for its security, for its reconstruction, and what the international community can do to help and help Palestinians rebuild uh, their lives. Even as all of this is happening, it's absolutely essential that humanitarian assistance get to the people who need it in Gaza. And as you know, uh, a couple of weeks ago, Secretary Austin and I wrote to the Defense Minister, Strategic Affairs Minister, uh, with a list of things that need to happen in order for assistance to get more effectively to people who need that assistance. So we went over that in some detail yesterday, uh, and I, I can report that there's progress made, which is good, but more progress needs to be made. And most critically, it needs to be sustained. We've had periods before where the Israelis have increased what they're doing, only to see it fall back. So we're tracking this very, very, very carefully, and we went over it in some detail. Finally, even as we're dealing with Gaza, with the hostages, with the humanitarian situation, it's also been an imperative for us to try to make sure that this conflict doesn't spread. Blinken's refusal to acknowledge these complexities, instead presenting a one-sided narrative that absolves Israel of responsibility, has only deepened the perception of U.S. hypocrisy in the Middle East. While the Biden administration claims to coordinate its response to human rights violations with Israel, the stark reality is that the U.S. has enabled one of the most devastating assaults on civilian life in recent history. The humanitarian disaster in Gaza, with its widespread destruction and staggering death toll, is a direct consequence of this unwavering U.S. support for Israel's military actions. As the international community watches in disbelief, it has become increasingly clear that the U.S., for all its talk of promoting human rights and democracy, is willing to overlook gross violations when it suits its strategic interests. This double standard has not gone unnoticed, and Blinken's embarrassing performance in Qatar only underscores the growing disillusionment with U.S. foreign policy in the region. The lies propagated by Blinken and Netanyahu that the resistance movement is solely to blame for the continued violence, that Israel is merely defending itself, and that the humanitarian toll in Gaza is a necessary consequence of that defense, have been laid bare for all to see. In truth, this is not a conflict of equals. It is an occupation, and until the U.S. is willing to confront this reality, its claims to moral leadership on the world stage will continue to ring hollow.